Get out. Sorry, man. Okay. Get out! Yo! 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 Chill, man. Get out! Chill! Get out! Chill! Chill! Greetings, fellow cinephiles. I am Naz Perez, and welcome to an exciting new episode of RT Essentials. This week, we're going back to when the zombie craze first ignited and witnessing the evolution of a particular voice in a particular genre that carried us all the way to the present where villains like the hook-handed Candyman are more alive than ever. Yes, horror films have long been reduced to parody-worthy tropes and recycled frights, but the artists on this list have brought fresh perspectives and personalities to the front of the line and done so in the face of adversity. Thanks to these films, we can be terrified, thrilled, and thought-provoked all at once. And I think we can all agree that the shallow slasher has morphed into something with far more depth and social commentary. So without further ado, these are the best black horror movies of all time. Get out. Why can't I move? You're paralyzed. Just like that day when you did nothing. You did nothing. Now. Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. And what better place to start than with writer-director Jordan Peele's Get Out, released in the U.S. on February 24th, 2017. The film stars Daniel Kaluuya, Allison Williams, Bradley Whitford, Stephen Root, Katherine Keener, and Caleb Landry-Jones. Kaluuya plays Chris Washington, and Williams plays Rose Armitage. The two are living a seemingly charmed life, young, in love, thriving in the bustling city. Everything is just peachy. That is, until Rose decides to invite Chris on a weekend getaway to meet her parents at their home in upstate New York. Now, Chris is reluctant, but ultimately agrees because, well, he's a good boyfriend. When Chris first arrives, he's surprised by how friendly and accommodating Rose's parents are. They're almost too nice. And as we know from horror films in the past, if something seems too good to be true, that's because it is. Now, as you can imagine, things quickly go awry, and what should have been a tranquil weekend of bonding turns into something out of Chris's worst nightmare. <laughs> oh, oh, no. 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 No, 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 no. I do something. Get Out was Jordan Peele's directorial debut and somewhat of a departure from his infamous sketch show, Key and Peele, though not entirely. The film does lean toward horror, but it's deeply rooted in satire, and Peele admits that his comedic background was actually crucial to how he approached his writing and directing. Peele also took inspiration from real life events, stating that he was once put into a similar situation with his now ex-girlfriend, but that it didn't turn out as bad as it did for his character, Chris. On a budget of less than $5 million, Get Out grossed over $255 million. This made Peele the first black writer-director to gross more than $100 million on a debut feature. Domestically, Get Out became the highest grossing debut based on an original screenplay in history, a record previously held by 1999's The Blair Witch Project. Aside from smashing the box office, critics unanimously praised Peele's work, and Rolling Stone actually called it a jolt a minute horror show laced with racial tension and stinging satirical wit. And Enemy wrote that it's a smart, creepy, cliche-destroying horror. Get Out also earned four Oscar nominations, with Peele becoming the first black winner in the Best Original Screenplay category. Blade. Let's do this. What could possibly be cooler than a half-human, half-vampire hybrid that knows martial arts? Exactly. Nothing. In the 1998 movie Blade, that damn peer is played by Wesley Snipes and is hell-bent on avenging his mother's death. The character first appeared as a supporting role in the Marvel comic book The Tomb of Dracula in 1973, and it soon grew to be the star of his own storylines. In the comic book version, Blade still hunted vampires, but he wasn't half-vampire himself. He was a human that had built up an immunity to vampire bites. It wasn't until Spider-Man the Animated Series aired an episode in 1996 entitled Blade the Vampire Hunter that the origin story that we know today was invented. Blade was directed by Stephen Norrington and, in addition to Snipes, featured performances by Stephen Dorff, Chris Christopherson, N. Boucher Wright, and Donald Logue. Originally, Snipes had actually aimed to make a Black Panther movie. He had even obtained the rights and had announced his plans to do so as early as 1992. Obviously, that project didn't work out at the time, so Snipes agreed to play Blade instead, but not without some roadblocks in between. 
Studios wanted Blade to be a spoof, with a character far less dark and vengeful. Some executives had even suggested changing Blade to be white, with the intention of appealing to a wider audience. Screenwriter David S. Goyer, who had been hired by New Line Cinema, refused this idea, and instead opted to keep the authentic nature of the character and story. But what does Goyer know about writing superhero films anyways? I mean, he's only written Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, Man of Steel, and Batman v Superman. Blade grossed over $131 million worldwide and spawned two sequels, also written by Goyer. The film also ignited Marvel's film successes that would dominate the industry for the next two decades and counting. Though critics were somewhat divided on this one, it's largely considered to be a defining role for Snipes. A Blade reboot is actually set for release in 2023 with the brilliant Mahershala Ali starring as the superhero. Candyman. You are not content with the stories, so I was obliged to come. The original Candyman was written and directed by English filmmaker Bernard Rose and based on Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden. The film stars Tony Todd, Virginia Madsen, Vanessa Williams, and Xander Berkeley, and was released in the US in October of 1992. Madsen plays Helen Lyle, a grad student writing her thesis on the link between folklore and the recent hardships that have fallen on one specific housing project in Chicago. Helen is especially skeptical about this Candyman character who residents believe to be responsible for a recent murder in their community. Now, according to urban legend, Candyman is the ghost of an African-American man who was brutally killed in the late 19th century after he engaged in a forbidden interracial love affair. Helen's skepticism shifts to real fear when a mysterious man that fits Candyman's description begins to stalk her. Believe in me. Be my victim. Rose gave his actors free reign to develop their characters' backstories, so Tony Todd went the extra mile with Candyman. In Barker's short story, Candyman's race, birthplace, and name are never mentioned. So the Candyman that we're familiar with today is very much a Tony Todd creation. In fact, it's hard to imagine what the movie would be without Todd's imaginative input. Candyman grossed over $26 million and launched a series of sequels, two released in the 90s and one in 2021. More on that soon. Critics were overall pleased with the film, with the Chicago Tribune writing that the action is swift, if excessively graphic, and Madsen proves to be a strong-willed, sympathetic lead. The New York Times also called it an elaborate campfire story with an unusually high interest in social issues. Candyman 2021. And Speak of the Devil, or The Ghost, I should say, a direct sequel to 1992's Candyman was released in 2021. Jordan Peele produced and co-wrote the script alongside with Mia DaCosta and Wynne Rosenfeld. Now, DaCosta was the obvious choice to direct this new version following the success of her critically acclaimed debut feature, Little Woods, which was released in 1998. It is a wonderful film and definitely worth a watch. In its early stages, this installment was meant to be more of a crossover film entitled Candyman vs. Leprechaun. I guess studio were hoping to ride the coattails of hits like Freddy vs. Jason, but Tony Todd wasn't having it. And if the Candyman himself says no, I mean, you'd better listen. So that idea was scrapped, probably for the better. And a few years later, Dion Taylor signed on to direct a reimagined version set in New England. But as is often the case, that idea fell apart due to legal disputes. It seemed that no matter how many times you repeated his name in the mirror, Candyman was nowhere to be found. You don't understand. Okay. I, I, I will show you that. Okay. Candyman. No! Candyman! No! No! Finally, in 2018, Peel announced that his company, Monkey Paw Productions, would be taking the reins with Todd reprising his role. The actor was pleased with this new direction, stating that he'd rather have Peel do it, someone with intelligence who's gonna be thoughtful and dig into the whole racial makeup of who the Candyman is and why he existed in the first place. And with Todd's blessing, the Candyman was back to life. 
Critics were mostly positive in their reviews, with The Hollywood Reporter writing that DaCosta used Bernard Rose's 1992 film as a jumping off point for bone chilling horror that expands provocatively on the urban legend of the first film within the context of black folklore and history. And the Boston Globe called it a cute, skillfully made, and pointedly political. Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> Chances are, if you are well versed in the zombie genre, then you've not only seen this film, but you are aware of its cultural significance. And if you haven't seen it, don't wait for the apocalypse, because George Romero's Night of the Living Dead is a must-see horror. Seriously, go watch it right now. I'll wait. No, but really. This movie has appeared on like countless greatest of all time lists, and it's considered to be the first modern zombie film. Night of the Living Dead was even selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry. Part of what made this 1968 film so ahead of its time was the decision to cast Dwayne Jones in the leading role, especially at a time of serious turmoil in the United States. The Vietnam War was raging on, the country was divided, and racial tensions were at an all-time high. Despite the circumstances, Jones stepped up and delivered an awe-inspiring performance as Ben, a pragmatic leader who tries to maintain order as flesh-eating zombies attack from all directions. There's more than there were. There are a lot out back, too. Now, this was truly one of the first times a black actor was given a leading role when the script didn't specifically call for it. But when asked about his decision, Romero simply said that Jones was the best actor we met. Night of the Living Dead went on to gross $30 million internationally on a budget of $125,000. I mean, that made it one of the most profitable films ever made. And critics praised the film with the LA Times singling out Jones by writing that the actor, quote, clearly has what it takes to go on to bigger things. And The Guardian writing that Romero conjures moments of eeriness and dread throughout. And yes, I mean, that is meant as a compliment. Ganja and Hess. Once again, Dwayne Jones delivered an outstanding performance in 1973's experimental horror, Blood Couple, also known as Ganja and Hess. Bill Gunn wrote, directed, and starred, and Marlene Clark also played a leading role. The film was first screened at the Cannes Film Festival during International Critics Week, where an emphasis is actually placed on discovering new talents from around the world. The movie follows Dr. Hess Green, an anthropologist studying the Murthians. It's okay, nobody else knew what the Murthians were either. And that's because Gunn made it up. But since you're wondering, it's an ancient African nation that exclusively consisted of vampires. And Hess possesses a mystical dagger left over from that ancient nation. Now, in a strange series of events, which may or may not include Hess drinking Gunn's character blood, that dagger actually turns Hess and his lover Ganja into blood-sucking immortals. So, why the two different movie titles? Well, the simple answer is that the original producers weren't happy with the box office numbers. So they pulled the film out of distribution and sold it to the company Heritage Enterprises. Heritage then restored and recut the film, so much so that they felt it deserved an entirely different name with alternative marketing. Hence, Ganja and Hess became Blood Couple. Despite an unsuccessful box office run, Blood Couple received a positive critical reception, with the Chicago Reader calling it a seminal take on black exploitation and horror. And Film Inquiry writing, it's a personal film and that its creator Gunn put his art and intellect on the line. I mean, Spike Lee loved the film so much, he remade it in 2014 under the title The Sweet Blood of Jesus. Attack the Block. Attack the Block is a sci-fi comedy horror written and directed by English filmmaker Joe Cornish. Now, it stars John Boyega, Jodie Whittaker, Alex Esmel, Leon Jones, and Franz Drame. 
and features music from the electronic duo Basement Jacks and notable composer Stephen Price. Boyega, Esmel, and Jones are a teenage street gang defending their South London neighborhood from evil alien invaders. Now, Boyega was relatively unknown at the time, having mostly performed in plays at the National Theatre and the Tricycle Theatre in the UK. This was his first major role in a feature film, and integral to his meteoric rise, leading to the iconic role of Finn in Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and The Rise of Skywalker. Someone please tell me what the f*** is going on. What's that thing chasing you? Why is the other lift full of bits of dead people? What are you doing? We need to go down! I ain't going down. There's too many things down there out to get me. Get me. What you say? Bear police, crazy gangsters, or f***ing top monsters down there. OK, good. Let's not go down. The film takes place over the course of a single night, Guy Fox night to be exact. Pop quiz, what date does Guy Fox night fall on? Come on, you must remember. Remember the 5th of November? Cornish expertly adds humor while maintaining shock and horror, and his movie title pays homage to the 1999 South Korean crime comedy Attack the Gas Station. Attack the Block was a box office flop, grossing just over one million in North America, but that didn't stop the film from becoming a cult classic and garnering an overwhelmingly positive critical response. RogerEbert.com praised the film's character development and Boyega's performance, and Wired Magazine listed it as one of the best films of the 2010s. A sequel is in development with Cornish once again writing and directing, and Boyega reprising his role and producing. His House. His House is a horror mystery thriller written and directed by Remy Weeks, and based on a story by Felicity Evans and Tony Venables. It stars Wanmi Masaku, Sope Derisu, and Matt Smith, and tells the story of a refugee couple who escape the violence in South Sudan and settle in a rundown house on the outskirts of London. It's a total adjustment, and the strange evil that lurks in their new town only proves to make matters worse. The fact that this was Remy Weeks' directorial debut makes the film honestly even more impressive. Because it's no simple task to avoid redundancy in a saturated genre, and to do so while balancing commentary on social issues like immigration, racism, and class inequality. It spoke to me. What did it say? We don't belong here. For his work, Weeks took home the British Independent Film Award for Best Director, winning against Florian Zeller and Sarah Gavron. Additionally, Masako's portrayal added new layers of depth to the film, and the role was one she felt compelled to take on, despite not being a fan of horror movies. Masako has said in interviews that she felt an emotional pressure upon reading this script, and that she wanted to be a part of it in any capacity. And her conviction paid off, because this performance earned her the British Independent Film Award for Best Performance by an Actress, and a nomination for the BAFTA for Best Actress. His House was officially released on October 30th, 2020, and distributed by Netflix. The LA Times called it a calculated mix of migrant drama and B-movie thrills, and the film review website That Shelf wrote that it's a multi-layered British set haunted house film that skillfully weaves socio-political commentary, an engrossing character study, and unnerving visual frights. Black Box. Emmanuel Osei Kufer Jr. wrote and directed Black Box, a psychological horror that stars Mamadou Ati, Felicia Rashad, Amanda Christine, and Charmaine Bingwa. The film was distributed by Amazon and released on October 6, 2020, with mastermind Jason Blum serving as an executive producer under Blumhouse Television. Ati plays Nolan, a single father suffering from amnesia, the result of a car accident that also killed his wife and left him in a temporary coma. A half a year later, and Nolan is still trying to put the pieces of his life back together, made all the more difficult by his incessant nightmares and inability to recall his true identity. Osei Kufer Jr. cleverly weaves sci-fi elements into the film, and as the plot unfolds, the emotional stakes heighten, and Nolan braces for a crushing big reveal. Ah. 
Ati carries the audience on this journey in a role that would be difficult for anyone. He captivates and manages to pull sympathy with his subtle choices. It's no wonder the actor has quickly built an impressive resume, starring in films like The Circle, The Front Runner, Unicorn Store, Underwater, and Uncorked. Ati's performance in Cake also earned him an Emmy nod for outstanding actor in a short form comedy or drama series. Black Box received generally favorable reviews, with many singling out Ati's performance and Osei Kufer Jr.'s direction. RogerEbert.com wrote that when you watch a debut like Black Box, you just know the director is gonna be around for a while. And we couldn't agree more. Us. The girl had a second child, a boy this time. They had to cut her open and take her from her belly. The shadow had to do it all. Self. Last up on our list is the horror mystery thriller Us, released on March 22nd, 2019, and brought to life by an absolute dream team of talent. Jordan Peele wrote and directed, Lupita Nyong'o, Winston Duke, Elizabeth Moss, and Tim Heidecker star, and Jason Blum, Sean McKittrick, and Ian Cooper produced. I mean, it's like the all-star games for cinema. Nyong'o plays Adelaide, Addie Wilson, mother to Zora and Jason, and wife to Gabriel, played by Duke. The family decides to go on vacation, returning to the beachfront home that Addie grew up in. Addie's apprehensive about the trip due to a traumatic childhood experience where she wandered off from her parents and found her way into a creepy fun house. While inside, young Addie encountered a perfect doppelganger of herself within the House of Mirrors, and the shocking image has haunted her ever since. Now, while on vacation, Addie can't shake the feeling that something terrible is gonna happen, despite her husband's reassurance. Turns out, she wasn't just triggered by her past, she had good reason to be scared because four masked strangers soon descend upon the house and the family must fight to survive the invasion. No, 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 And here's the kicker, each one of the masked strangers is a perfect doppelganger of each one of the family members. It is disturbing, sometimes funny, and always entertaining in classic Jordan Peele fashion. Us was a commercial triumph, grossing over $255 million worldwide against a budget of $20 million. It had the second best opening for a live action original film just behind 2009's Avatar, and the best ever opening for an original horror film that wasn't based on known property. The New Yorker called the film a colossal achievement, The Hollywood Reporter called it a fiercely scary movie whose meaning is up for grabs, and Rolling Stones described it as spill your soda scary. Love that description. And there you have it, friends, our selections for the best black horror movies of all time. As always, we couldn't mention every film that fits the bill, but don't fret, new episodes of RT Essentials are always on the horizon. I'm Naz Perez, and thank you again for tuning in. And remember, if you find yourself in a horror film and something seems too good to be true, that's because it is. <laughs>